to ask Pastor Mark to please uh, lead us in prayer. Amen. All right, so I've got the bell because uh, for the first time I intend on using the bell this morning. All right, so uh, title for the lesson today is Be a Love Revolutionary. Uh, and this was a last minute little change uh, based on a uh, game show that my wife and I like to watch. Uh, and I'll get to that in a moment. So uh, last lesson I, I gave um, last month, uh, sort of ended with um, the string of lights, if you remember, and then when one of those lights gets unplugged, several lights uh, go out. And even though everything I had read and shared with you really spoke to our interconnectedness as mankind, you know, I have to admit what was in my brain is us as a church family. But I want to remind you the interconnectedness that uh, I was speaking of is not for our families. It's not for our church family. It's for all of mankind, all of humanity. Um, and I think that that's very important to remember. Uh, little did I know the events of the last two weeks uh, would be occurring. And uh, what happens to a few really does impact all of us. So uh, Melissa and I uh, will watch Family Feud, and um, it's almost a daily occurrence. And on Thursday night, uh, I think it was Thursday night, we were watching, and you know, Steve Harvey goes in, and he introduces families, and the one family was there, and the fourth woman, who was a very good player, um, was introduced and he stopped and he said, you know what, you call yourself something and, and what is that? And she said, I'm a love revolutionary. And I went, oh my gosh, that goes exactly to what my message is today. And he said, well, why is that? And she said, because I like to do random acts. She didn't say of kindness. She said random acts of love. And that's really ultimately what I hope to inspire out of all of us uh, today. Um, so if you will turn to Ecclesiastes 3, if you'd like. I'm um, not going to spend a lot of time uh, reading that entire selection. But um, just to remind us, uh, um, the things that we saw that happened in Washington, D.C. Uh, very recently um, continue to demonstrate how divided we are as a nation. And those divisions, unfortunately, extend in to the body of Christ, His church. Now, I'm not necessarily speaking of faith community church, but I'm talking about Christianity as a whole. So in Ecclesiastes 3, I really want to point out verse 8, but Ecclesiastes 3 tells us there is a time for everything and a season for everything under the heavens. Verse 8 specifically says, there's a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. And unfortunately for us, we are in a time of hate. It describes pretty much the condition that we're in right now. You know, we know as Christians that overall we live in a world of darkness. And for us, I think, at least I, I'll speak for me, this pandemic and all of the things that have happened in the last 10 months have exposed a lot of things. A lot of things within me personally. A lot of things I think in our families, within this church, and surely as a nation. Now, I want to be careful 
in terms of what you hear, what I'm about to say, God has used this pestilence and famine. God has used to bring to the surface these hatreds and divisions that exist in our country today. And sadly, this has been with us a long time. Um, very recently, I began listening to podcasts. Um, and, you know, I have an hour drive to work and an hour drive back home. And um, so I've taken to listen to different programs, and I'm more of a nonfiction kind of person. And I heard an ad for one that was called, the name of the podcast was, is called It Was Said. And it was uh, in partnership with the History Channel. And it is 10 episodes, one episode each for 10 speeches within the recent past. Now what's interesting, at least for me, is... As I looked at the list, there were people I absolutely, oh yeah, I like that person. And there were people, ugh, I don't really care for that person. Now I have a confession to make. When I see these people on television that I don't like, and uh, my daughter who's um, out there controlling the, um, the, the live stream will attest to this, as well as my wife, I will immediately hit mute. Boom. Or turn the channel. But here's my revelation. How is that not hatred? How is that not division? That I cannot tolerate to hear what somebody else has to say who's different whose views are different than mine? How awful is that? that? That's hatred. That is division. Now, I respect what Pastor Mark does greatly because he's done something over the what I will call decades that I would never consider to do. He'll actually buy books and read up on people and viewpoints that are different from his. That's seeking knowledge. We should not be afraid of knowledge. We should not use... Oh, my phone's there. We should not be using our technology to filter out messages that we don't want to hear. Could that be the cause or a contributing factor? I don't want to say the cause. Could that not be a contributing factor of this great division that we see in this country? So, with that, there are um, some speeches that I'd like to take excerpts from. Just to illustrate the fact that we are still in the same condition that we've been for the last more than 50 years. I'd like to start with one of my personal heroes, Robert Kennedy. I will probably cry several times through this, so just bear with me. I'm already, I say his name, and I'm, I'm welling up with tears. These are remarks that he made on April 4th in Indianapolis, Indiana, to a group of around a thousand African American supporters who thought they were going to hear a campaign speech. But instead, Kennedy had to inform them of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. This is what he said. In this difficult day, in this difficult time for the United States, it's perhaps well to ask what kind of nation we are and what direction we want to move in. 
For those of you who are black, considering the evidence, evidently, is that there were white people who were responsible, you can be filled with bitterness, with hatred, and a desire for revenge. We can move in that direction as a country in greater polarization, black people amongst black and white amongst white, filled with hatred toward one another. Or we can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, to understand and to comprehend and to replace that violence, that stain of bloodshed that is spread across our land with an effort to understand compassion and love. Then he spoke to them about the killing of his brother John to let them know that he shared a common pain with them. He went on to say, what we need in the United States is not division. What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness, but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another and a feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or whether they be black. So I ask you tonight to return home to say a prayer for the family of Martin Luther King. Yeah, it's true. But more importantly, to say a prayer for our own country, which all of us love. A prayer for understanding and that compassion which I spoke. We can do well in this country. We will have difficult times. We've had difficult times in the past, but we, and we will, have difficult times in the future. It is not the end of violence. It is not the end of lawlessness. And it's not the end of disorder. But the vast majority of white people and the vast majority of black people in this country want to live together. And I will pause. Remember Pastor Mark's message last week about the one percenter? So here it is in a speech. I will repeat, but the vast majority of white people and the vast majority of black people in this country want to live together, want to improve the quality of our life, and want justice for all human beings that abide in our land. And let's dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago, to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world let us dedicate ourselves to that and say a prayer for our country and for our people. Two months later, he too would be killed. King and Kennedy both knew that they were putting their lives at risk, yet they championed the cause that they believed in. King and Kennedy our love revolutionaries. Another love revolutionary was Barbara Jordan. Don't know if you remember her. Those of us who are a little bit older will know of her. She was the first African American elected to the Texas Senate after Reconstruction and the first Southern African American woman elected to the United States House of Representatives. She came to fame during the impeachment process against Richard Nixon, and as the first African American, as well as the first woman, to deliver a keynote address to the Democrat National Convention. Her journey to the podium at Madison Square Garden in 1976 was rooted in distant Texas. Jordan was born in segregated Houston in 1936 and her childhood was centered on church. Her mother was a teacher in the church. Her father was a Baptist preacher. And her views were shaped primarily by her grandfather's teachings, he as well being a preacher. As she recalled it, he drilled this lesson into her on Sunday evenings. And I quote, 
Just remember, the world is not a playground, but a schoolroom. Life is not a holiday, but an education. But an education. One eternal lesson for us all to teach us how better we should love. This is what Barbara Jordan had to say during that keynote address in 1976. And now, now we must look to the future. Let us heed the voice of the people and recognize their common sense. If we do not, we not only blaspheme our political heritage, we ignore the common ties that bind all Americans Many fear the future, many are distrustful of their leaders, and believe that their voices are never heard. Many seek only to satisfy their private work, wants, to satisfy their private interests. But this is the great danger America faces, that we will cease to be one nation and become instead a collection of interest groups. City against suburb, region against region, individual against individual, each seeking to satisfy private wants. If that happens, who will then speak for America? Who then will speak for the common good? How prophetic. Does this not sound like America today? We as Christians are not immune from this hatred. We allow our political views to disrupt what we know we should be doing. And oftentimes and I speak euphemistically as the collective we, we will use the Word of God to justify our viewpoints, political viewpoints. And unfortunately, very little has changed since the 1968 speech and the 1976 speech. We still have racism. We still have needless killings. We still have areas of great poverty. We still have these divisions. And I guess what distresses me more than anything else is what role or lack of role the body of Christ has played in all of this. I want each one of us to consider, since the assassinations of Kennedy and King, we have had something called the charismatic movement that swept through this country and the world through the 1970s and lasted into the early 90s. The results of this revival was not an army of love revolutionaries. Instead, if you look today, many of our churches look like auditoriums, not churches. They put on great shows with bright lights, large screens, fancy graphics, booming sound. They are filled with Christians who name it and claim it, who like to point out what is wrong with the world and our society and our government, and do very little to help those people who are in need. As a result, the body of Christ has become self-centered, self-indulgent, and worst of all, self-righteous. Please turn to Luke chapter 10. if you will. 
Our current state reminds me very much of the world in Jesus' time, does it not? When Jesus came the first time, he actually took on the church. He was seeking to build his own army of love revolutionaries. One story that comes to mind that illustrates this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. So I'm going to start reading in verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, Who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down, from the priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man he passed by on the other side so too a levite when he came to the place and saw him passed by on the other side but a samaritan as he traveled came to where the man was and when he saw him he took pity on him he went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any expense, any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Jesus was pointing out the sin of the religious leaders by making an example of the priest and the Levite who could not be bothered to help. The Samaritan was a love revolutionary. We need to heed Jesus' call and go and do likewise. In Matthew 5, we find the Sermon on the Mount. And in verse 9, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Where are the peacemakers today? Christ came into the world as the great peacemaker, not only to reconcile us to God, but to reconcile us to each other. Peacemakers are love revolutionaries. Peter instructed us on how to become a love revolutionary. In 2 Peter 1, if you'll turn there, he shows us there's eight steps. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Peter. We know about Peter. And we know that he denied Jesus three times. And we know that in John 21, it chronicles how Jesus wanted to make sure that he restored Peter out of his grace. So he asked Peter three times, do you love me? And three times Peter responded back that he loved Jesus. To take away the stain of the three times that he denied Jesus. But the flaws of Peter still remained. So while they were walking on that beach, Jesus was telling him, this is what's going to happen to you, Peter. And when you were an old man, they're going to take your life from you. What was Peter's first response? P 
Peter was somebody who compared himself to other people. Peter always wanted to be first. What did Peter do? He turned around and he said, hey, what about John? And I love Jesus' response. He said, you could almost picture him getting really close to Peter, maybe even holding on to his robe and saying, you follow me. We have the very same answer. Jesus is telling us through all this stuff that's going on in the world. He's saying, you follow me. We make the same mistake, don't we? We can take the Bible and apply it to others. That's self-righteousness. What Jesus is saying to us is, the Bible was not written for them. It's written for you. We need to apply the Word of God to us. You follow me. So, here are the eight steps in 2 Peter 1, 5-7. Three verses. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. So let's take a closer look at these. It all starts with faith. And that faith is in Jesus Christ. We have to ever keep before us that Jesus is the source and the cross is the means. If you want to become a love revolutionary, it begins with Jesus and accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Then Peter said, add to your faith virtue. Virtue means moral excellence, strength, and courage. Certainly, we need strength and courage in our current situation to profess the doctrines of the gospel. Then to practice them in our daily lives, we need morals, which is our character. Practicing the doctrines enables us to become love revolutionaries. And to virtue knowledge. Knowledge is the accumulation of information. We get knowledge by reading the Bible. The more we read it, the more knowledge we get. I highly recommend that you read the Bible every day. Through knowledge we gain understanding, which is the ability to use knowledge to make decisions. In this case, using and applying biblical principles in our everyday decision-making. As we make decisions and good decisions, we gain experience which gives us wisdom. Biblical wisdom allows us to do the right thing in every situation. We must strive diligently for the wisdom and knowledge that will enable us to know the good and acceptable will of God. And to knowledge temperance. Temperance is moderation. Christians should practice moderation in everything. And that would include being moderate in our desires, even for the necessities of life. And not feel that we have to have the best that money can buy. Such as food or clothing or shelter, houses, cars. You know, in the Old Testament, the Israelites were instructed to reserve a part of what they got for the poor. It's not simply a matter of giving tithe. In addition to the tithe, they were instructed to withhold so that they could be generous to the poor. We should do the same. And to temperance, patience. 
Man is born into trouble, and we need patience to bear up under all the problems and even the calamities that come at times, especially like now. And the cross that a wise and holy God see fit to lay upon us as we travel our own individual road. We need patience now more than ever before. And to patience godliness. In bearing afflictions patiently, a person learns a childlike fear and reverent love that makes for true godliness. And to godliness brotherly kindness. Since we are all children of the same father, servants of the same master, members of the same family, travelers to the same country, and heirs of the same inheritance, we need brotherly kindness and love so that we can live together in harmony on life's road to heaven. Brotherly kindness is kindness to the body of Christ. It's kindness to people within your church family. And then finally, Peter said, to brotherly kindness, charity. In other words, love. Love and goodwill for all mankind must be added to our peculiar love for the children of God. I want to emphasize at this point, Peter says, add to. He didn't say God will just, we have to work at adding these. It's our responsibility. We have to take the next step as we progress on these eight steps. So I want to go back to Barbara Jordan. She still had hope for our country. This is what she said. This is the question which must be answered in 1976. See if it rings true today. Are we to be one people bound together by a common spirit, sharing in a common endeavor, or will we become a divided nation? For all of its uncertainty, we cannot flee the future. We must not become the new Pur Puritans and reject our society. We must address and master the future together. It can be done if we restore the belief that we share in a sense of national community, that we share a common national endeavor. It can be done. Another one of my heroes, Ronald Reagan, was a love revolutionary. That might seem controversial to some. But Reagan had a strong faith in God instilled in him by his mother. His belief in Christ never faded. In the 1980s, when the nation was at a low point, he led something called the Reagan Revolution. During his farewell address to the nation, upon leaving office, he said these words. And that's about all I have to say tonight, except for one thing. The past few days when I've been at that window upstairs, I've thought a bit of the city, the shining city upon a hill. The phrase comes from John Winthrop, who wrote it to describe the America he imagined. What he imagined was important because he was an early pilgrim, an early freedom man. He journeyed here on what today we'd call a little wooden boat. And like the other pilgrims, he was looking for a home that would be free. I've spoken of the shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds, living in harmony and peace, a city with free ports that hummed with commerce and creativity, and if there had to be a city wall, then the walls had doors, and the doors were always open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. That's how I saw it and see it still. Reagan believed that the United States was a beacon 
a magnet for all who must have freedom, for all the pilgrims from all the lost places who were hurtling through the darkness toward home. He gave us a vision, something to strive for as love revolutionaries. We are citizens of that shining city. It is the love revolutionaries that light that city. Are you a beacon? Are you loving those pilgrims? Are you bringing unity in the face of great political divide? Are you a peacemaker? Are you bringing healing to the hurting? Are you count, countering hatred with love? Are you a love revolutionary? I'll end with a quote from a speech given by another love revolutionary, John Lewis. He was a member of Congress representing Georgia for 33 years until his death last year. In the 1960s, he was a civil rights leader working for Martin Luther King Jr. He was an organizer and a speaker at the 1963 March on Washington, a march that he said displayed the spirit of love and the spirit of dignity. As part of his closing remarks, and with a clarion call, Lewis said, I appeal to all of you to get into this great revolution that is sweeping this nation. Get in and stay in the streets of every city, every village, and every hamlet of this nation until true freedom comes, until the revolution of 1776 is complete. We must get in this revolution and complete this revolution. So I ask you today to join me to reject hatred, to reject division, to reject self-righteousness, and instead be a love revolutionary. Thank you very much.